Any questions, brothers and sisters? Yes, go on. Thank you. Peace with you. My name's Sebastian. Go on. Uh, you caught me off a bit on when you're talking about the virtues. So I had some idea, but obviously you have virtue, morality, and values. So they kind of uh, mix and mash, if yeah. that makes sense. You know, so. Okay, so what's the difference between morality and virtue? Morality is an absolute. It is a, a value system, a value system like the family, like the church, like the gospel and evangelizing, or like telling the truth, or keeping your word, or being faithful to your wife and to your commitments. These are values. Virtues is how you live them out. It's the habit of life that you act out on a daily basis to make real the value, <coughs> the value that you believe in. Ginner, invite you to come a bit closer so I don't have to shout as much. So a value is an absolute red line issue. You can't negotiate. A virtue is you living out that value habitually in your thinking, in your emotions, and in your actions. And that's why virtue ethics is the normative ethics of the Christian faith. Any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? Any questions? Going once. Do you believe yep. we're going to see in our lifetime the revelations play out? So the, did, did you hear the question at the back? Yeah? Okay. So I would say that Christians are not committed to a literal reading of revelations. You, we're not committed to a literal reading of revelations. But whatever interpretation of revelations you have... The book was written for the church back in the first century. So it is something that is applicable in every year of the church's life. Are we going to see the, the revelation uh, end times kind of uh, scenario play out? Depends in part about how you interpret revelations. But I would say at some level, every year of the church has seen in some way revelations play out. Why? Because there are antichrists in every generation. Hitler was an antichrist. Stalin was an antichrist. Napoleon was an antichrist. Mohammed was an antichrist. Nero was an antichrist. Che Guevara was an antichrist. There are many antichrists. All of those that set themselves off, all of those that set themselves up against Christ are antichrist. Don't feed the trolls. So to answer your question, maybe and yes. Any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? What's your, what's your opinion on the fact that, that we have different books, different accounts for the same situation where details uh, are different? You mean in the Gospels, for instance? In the Gospels. I believe that it's a good thing because it gives us a journalistic kind of perspective. You know? So you can compare and see which is the account. Okay, I get the question. So the question is, how do I understand the fact that the Gospels, for instance, have different tellings of the same story? Well, the first thing that you've got to recognize from these kind of new atheist arguments that are borrowed by the Dower team here in the corner is that Christians have never said that the Gospels were video recordings of events. All of you, ladies and gentlemen, if you went away from this exact moment into the cafes 
around Speaker's Corner and you wrote down what you had seen and heard right now and you did it today and then you came back and you compared your notes with one another the notes would not be the same because different ones of you will have observed different things you would have paid attention at different times you would have been struck by different comments you would have valued one saying over another saying and all of you will have written a true record and all of your true records would be different and that is exactly what happens in the Gospels the Gospels are talking about the same events but to different communities different parts of the story were important than other parts and so the stories differ but they are no problem to the validity of the New Testament no problem at all it is a crass argument to say that because two people tell uh, a conflicting story in quote marks that therefore the story can't be trusted because I guarantee that you've all been in a situation where two people have both been telling the truth but you've given different accounts of the same event you ever been in that situation with a friend you ever been in that situation with a relative so it's something you've all experienced any other questions ladies and gentlemen go on bro if you live the, if you live by the sword you die by the sword but so i understand uh, it's sort of against the teachings of christ but I want to bear in mind that there are many people suffering, many people who can't really defend themselves. What's the question? Is there, will I be forgiven if I have to go to war, for example? Right. So the question is, can a Christian go to war? Yes. Jesus, when he said that he who lives by the sword dies by the sword, is telling you a truth. Men of violence are dealt with by violence. The Houthis are learning that very reality right now. Hamas is learning that lesson right now. ISIS learned that lesson just a few years ago. And God willing, Boko Haram and the Fulani terrorists of Nigeria Central Belt will also learn that lesson. The reality is, ladies and gentlemen, there is nothing in the New Testament that commits the Christian to pacifism. So the brother misspoke when he said it's against Christ's teaching to go to war. That's not how John of Damascus understood it. That's not how St. Augustine understood it. That's not how St. Jerome understood it. And which one of you, my brothers, would say that you know the Bible better than the saints? The reality is that pacifism is a moral option in the Christian worldview. It is not a moral obligation. However, Christians cannot fight in idolatrous armies for idolatrous states. I was someone that was going to join the army. The reason why I decided not to join the army is because Britain started bombing Serbia. Who remembers when Britain bombed Serbia? Yes, that war is what stopped me joining the British army. Because as a Christian, I cannot bear arms against another Christian. But Christians can fight against jihadis Amen. we can fight against the mujahideen we can fight against anti-fascista we can fight against blm when they invade our churches we can fight against those that persecute christians ladies and gentlemen but i want to be clear do not hear my words as encouraging vigilantism I don't want anyone to walk away with anything like that the vile jihads 
that are being waged against Christians around the world by trash that call themselves Mujahideen. These dogs must be fought to the death, but they must be done so within a legal framework through legal armies constituted by legitimate authorities. So Christians are not pacifists. Any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? Great question. What makes a legitimate authority? In terms of the traditional teaching about just war, a legitimate authority is a government, a recognized government, a legal government. But there are examples where governments break down, where the rule of law breaks down. And in those situations, the church becomes a legitimate authority. So, for example, in Syria, when the jihadis invaded Syria, supported by Western internationalists, and tried to destroy the Syrian state, because the US was playing geopolitics and wanted to bomb Iran and needed a base close enough to do so. The Christian primate of Syria encouraged the Christians to join the Syrian army. And many Christians fought and died in the Syrian army against Mujahideen dogs and Mujahideen trash. But in the Sudan, when the vile Islamist dogs cried out Allahu Akbar and took black slaves and raped black women and killed two million Christians, that was done by the government. And it was the church that legitimized the fight of the Sudanese People's Liberation Army against the jihadis. So to answer your question, where legal governments exist and the rule of law exists, it should be a government. But when rule of law breaks down and governments break down, the church becomes a legitimate authority. Let, 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 do you want to debate, sir? Then let, let me take another question from someone else and I'll come back to you. Any other questions? Go on. There's been so many Christians dying on Christmas Day. Again, brother, Fulani, Fulani militants in Nigeria are killing tens and thousands of Christians. How many of you heard about that on the BBC? The BBC. No, no. How many of you have heard about the bombings in Palestine on the BBC? Do you see the double standards of the left-wing media? A black Christian is not as important as a fair-skinned, white-skinned Palestinian Muslim. If you're a black Christian, the left-wing media don't give a damn about your life. But if you're someone who looks white like me, and you're a Muslim, the BBC can't stop talking enough about your sufferings. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you that the lives of my Nigerian brothers and sisters in Africa is more important to me than the lives of Islamist supporters in Palestine. And all of us as Christians must be the voice for our brothers and sisters in Pakistan, in Egypt, in Malaysia, in the Philippines, in Indonesia, in Nigeria, in the Sudan, in Burma. And they are dying at the hands of their persecutors and none of those liberal left-wing virtue signaling celebrities like Gary Lineker give a damn about what's happening to our brethren. So we must make the noise for them. 
So I laid down this challenge to every Nigerian Christian in London. Why are you not organizing protests for the persecuted church in Nigeria? Why are you not challenging that weak bishop in Canterbury called Justin Welby to make a noise for your dying brothers and sisters in Nigeria? Why are we not standing up for the Christians of Armenia? 120,000 of them driven from their homes and no one has done a thing. No one gives a damn. Not the Americans, certainly not the Russians. We are the only ones that will ever stand up for ourselves. And so it is on you, my brothers and sisters, to find your strength to stand up for the persecuted church. Any other questions, ladies and gentlemen, on any topic? Are you aware that thousands of mosques are closing in Iran because they have a vision and dreams of Jesus Christ? So, ladies and gentlemen, I bring you good news of great joy. Iran is the first post-Muslim country in the world. It's the first post-Islamic country in the world. And I want to say to all of you Persians, well done. Well done. Well done, Persians. Down with the Ayatollah, down with the dictator, down with Sharia law. Ladies and gentlemen, the Persians were Arabized when they were conquered by Arabs. And the Arabs brought Arabization to the Iranian people. A people of great learning, of great culture, of great civilization. You look at the photos of Iran before the, rev before the revolution in the 1970s and you compare it to Iran today and the images are stark. One is a country that is wealthy, prosperous, happy, civilized, hospitable, warm, full of life. The other is miserable, bankrupt, hypocritical, backwards and fighting against itself. So I want to say to the Iranian people that the church stands with you as you throw off Islam. And I want to say to you Kurds, who are the ones that are bombing you and your cities? Muslims, not Israel. It's Turkey, your Muslim brothers, who bombed you and who killed thousands of you. Muslims from Iraq and who has denied you a homeland, Kurds. Not the Jews, the Muslims. And who is speaking up for you now? Is it a Jew? Is it a Muslim? Or is it a Christian? The reality is, Kurds, that we Christians stand with you for you to have a homeland. Your allies are the Christians. Your persecutors are the Muslims. So join the Iranians and throw off Islam. Throw off Arabization. Set yourself free. Treat your brothers in Christ, the Syrians and the Aramaic Christians, with mercy and unite yourself to a civilized world. Any other questions on any topic? So when people have a uh, no moralistic argument against the Christian nationalism, right? So why are they? Why do you feel they're against it? So why other religions feel more subjugated when it comes to Christian nationalism? Right. So let's be clear. Christian nationalism is a term that is emerged out of America. So some of you may not have heard that term before. It's an American debate. And it is an American term created by the political left to create the boogeyman of the church. Ooh, beware of those Christian nationalists because they want to ban pornography. 
They want to stop child molestation. They want to stop abortion. They want to stop divorce. They don't want polygamy. They don't want to be subject to dimitude. They don't want a world of free sex where people get drunk all the time. No, beware of those Christian nationalists. They want a culture where families are wholesome, where people aren't slaves to drugs and intoxicants. However, however, there is a Christian nationalism that's harmful, that is untrue. This idea that America has a special place in history to do a special thing for God. I want to tell you if you're a Christian in America, that is not in the Bible. America does not have a special mission from God. Neither does the United Kingdom, neither does France, neither does Russia. The only group that has a special mission from God that you can back up biblically is the church. That is the only group that has a mission from God. And so, when we talk about pan-Christian solidarity, as you are hearing me talk, we are rediscovering an idea that has laid within the church, dormant for more than 400 years. We're recovering an understanding of Christianity that has been suppressed by the Enlightenment for 400 years. We're recovering our past as Christians. And the world hates that idea. The idea that we should be Christians unashamed. The idea that we believe that the teachings of Jesus are the answer to our political questions, or the answer to our cultural questions, or the answer to our economic questions. The world hates that idea because the Enlightenment is based upon the suppression of that idea. And so we must free ourselves from the Enlightenment to embody our faith fully. Any other questions? Does the Quran, does it have anthropomorphic language that like we do, yes, in the Holy Bible? So, ladies and gentlemen, some Muslims attack the Bible because the Bible has anamorphic descriptions of God. It says that God rises up like a man out of a drunken slumber. It says God roars like a lion. It says that God rested on the seventh day. And Muslims look at the Bible and they say that these descriptions are unworthy of God. How can that be God? That's insulting to God. Put your hand up if you've heard a Muslim make that kind of argument. Right. So how shocked was I when I picked up my Quran and I heard that Allah's hands were on their hands. That in the hadiths it says Allah has two right hands. Two right hands. The guy's an invalid, he doesn't even have a left one. That it says in the Quran that Allah descends to the lowest heaven and that he rises above his throne. Anthropomorphic language is in the Quran. He's described as having an eyes, eyes, having a one shin. What? <laughs> a one shin. Don't try to picture this. It's kind of scary. It's like a deformed golem. But yet that's the anamorphic descriptions of Allah in the Quran. So how can we Christians take a lesson from Muslims about anamorphic language when their Quran and their Hadiths are full of anamorphic language, including that Allah has a shape. 
Double standards. Didn't Allah create a shape on those created things? Okay, any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? What do I think about the rapture? The rapture is a doctrine that was invented less than 200 years ago in America and it has very poor historical precedent in the church. The reality is, whilst it doesn't define you whether you're a Christian or not, and a Christian can believe it and still be a Christian, it isn't something that I personally believe in. And I think it's a very minor error of some churches. Any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? Questions going once. Go on, sir. I mean, the very question itself, has someone stole my bag? Thank you. The very question is, do I believe in free grace? It kind of makes me wonder, brother, if you know what the word grace means. Grace means gift. And whenever have you had to pay for a gift, the whole point of a gift is that it is free. So, unless you mean something very technical by that that I don't understand, go on. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's be clear. This is one of those kind of test you, are you a Christian kind of questions. Right? How, how long have I been stood here talking about our Lord Jesus Christ? About an hour. Right? Christians, do better. Okay? As Christians, all Christians believe that we are saved by grace. God's grace saves us. We do not save ourselves. All the works that you do to the glory of God that you were predestined to walk in, as the scripture says, is God's gift to you that you can walk in that work, that you can do that work. All the virtue that you have is God's gift to you that you can walk in virtue. And yes, righteousness is the embodiment of virtue. But it is not your work to God. It is the Holy Spirit's work in you. And you receive it by faith. Any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? I think Psalms 91 is the most powerful prayer in the, in the Bible. And the so, questions like, what do you think is the most powerful prayer in the Bible? This is kind of churchianity stuff, right? It's where Christian myths and Christian legends come from. You show me any verse in the Bible that says, Psalm 91 is the most powerful prayer. There's no such teaching. Any prayer said faithfully, sincerely, in the name of Jesus, to God the Father, by the Holy Spirit, by a righteous man availeth much because that's what the scriptures teach and Jesus himself when he was asked to teach prayer he didn't say go and read Psalm 91 he taught the Lord's prayer so anyone anyone who teaches ideas I'm not saying you do sir anyone who teaches ideas like You've got to say this prayer in these words, apart from Jesus' words, because Jesus taught them, or that this prayer is super powerful and has some magic power, right? That is poor teaching. It's not, it's not, an, it's not an error that makes you unchristian. it's just poor teaching. All prayers of a righteous man availeth much when they are said in the name of Jesus by the Holy Spirit. Whether they be your words, the words of Psalm 91, or the words of our Father, the Lord's Prayer. Any other questions? Go on, sir. Uh, it's about 
Yeah, so the Jews are very smart and, you know, they are, to say, God's chosen people. Why are they not understanding that it's so obvious that Jesus is their Savior? Okay, let's be clear. There are stereotypes that are positive and there are stereotypes that are negative. The brother said all Jews are smart. Well, not, not all. I want to tell him I've met some really stupid Jews. <laughs> there are a lot of smart Jews, no doubt about it. But I've met some dumb Jews. But the question is why don't the Jews recognize that Jesus is the Messiah? I'll tell you why. That because for 1,900 years, their rabbis have been telling the Jewish community not to read the New Testament, not to learn about Jesus, and that they have been lying about what Christians believe, saying that we are idolaters, that we are worship vision, uh, images and material things. These are the lies of the rabbis. I'm speaking to a Jew right now in Israel. We're, we're zooming, we're talking to one another. And he said that when he stopped listening to the rabbis and picked up the New Testament, he saw things that have made him think that Jesus is the Messiah. The reality is if you're a Jew watching this, your rabbis are lying to you about the church and they are lying to you about Christianity. Christianity is a Judeo-Christian movement. It is a Judeo-Christian movement because our beliefs are rooted inside first century second temple Judaism. They are, they are Jewish ideas that you find in the New Testament. They are Jewish beliefs that you find in the New Testament. It's just that the church is made up of Gentiles who believed the Jews when they told us that their Messiah had come. Any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? Are the new, are the new Jews the Pharisees of the Bible? Or the rabbis, rather? So, ladies and gentlemen, there aren't new Jews in the sense of there is a genetic continuity of the Jewish people. But there is a new Jewish religion. A Jewish religion that was born after the church. The church predates rabbinical Judaism. Rabbinical Judaism crystallized in the fifth century. Christian, the Christian church is a Jewish movement born in the first century. And we predate the rabbinical movement by centuries. So the rabbis, are they going by the El, tradition of Any the other questions? I'll come back to you, Sam. Any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? Go on, bro. So, ladies and gentlemen, some erroneous teachings teach word magic. People that teach word magic say things like, if you believe it and you say in Jesus' name that God is obliged to give it to you. But consider what Jesus said when he was teaching about persistence in prayer. If your child asks for bread, will he give them a viper? No. So the Father will give you all good things that you ask for in prayer. But he knows what is good for you, not you. And he knows what is good for your church and for those that you will interact with, not you. And it may be that God could give you something good, but because he gives you this good thing, your interactions with others will damage them. And God will sometimes give you things that test you and strengthen you. And by testing and strengthening you, call other Christians to a greater Christian faith. So when I hear this, that Christ said that what you ask in his name, 
the Father will give you. I remember all the caveats. I remember that Paul said that you operate, you're the reason why you were becoming sick, the reason why your prayers were not being answered is because you were not doing as Christ taught, which is to pursue the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these things shall be added unto you. Prayer is not word magic. You are not God's boss. God does not owe you a damn thing. God is your father. He loves you as a father and he wants to give you the good things of a father. But God is also your king and you are also subjects in his kingdom. And sometimes the king sends his subjects to do war. And war always involves suffering. War always involves sacrifice. And so there is nothing in the Bible that teaches that God is obliged to make your life comfortable and happy. Nothing. Any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? Go on, bro. Can you just elaborate for me, uh, Mark 8 from verse 14, uh, the use of the Pharisees. So he talks about um, uh, the, his followers uh, weren't understanding him when he was talking about the, the bread and then separating it from seven and then 12. He was trying to emphasize a point there uh, that I didn't fully grasp. I, I, bro, I'll have to, you'll have to okay. send me this question in writing and, okay. and, and I'll have to read the passage because I don't know the passage off the okay, top of my head. How many verses is it? From 14 to 21. 14 to 21? Yeah, just to Okay, right, do you want to read it to everybody? Read it to that brother over there with a the beard. Uh, right, we're going to read from the Gospel. And when we finish reading from the Gospel, what are we going to say? Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ, in response to this is the Gospel of the Lord. Go on, bro. So read loud to that brother at the back. So this is the book of Mark, uh, chapter 8, Verse 14. Read loud. The yeast of the Pharisees and Herod, Herod, right? So... Just but, read, bro. Okay. The disciples had forgotten to bring the bread, except for one loaf they had with them in the boat. Be careful, Jesus warned them. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. They, they discussed this with one another and said, it is because we have no bread. Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked them, Why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see, and ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember when I broke the five loaves for the five uh, thousand, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? Twelve, they replied. And when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? They answered seven. He said to them, do you still not understand? This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. You'll get it eventually, guys. And it'd be great, ladies and gentlemen, if whenever you hear someone preaching or reading from the gospel and they finish, you say loudly in the crowd, Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. There you go, you got it, bro. Okay, so let's just go over this. The signs that Jesus performed were signs that confirmed his ministry and confirmed his teachings. That was the point of the signs. And Jesus' teachings was about the kingdom of God and about the coming of the kingdom of God and about how he was bringing the kingdom of God into the world. Christ said that the, the kingdom of God, that, that, that the church was like yeast. The kingdom of God was like yeast in the whole, in the bread. It would leaven and cause the whole bread to rise. Do you remember that parable? Do you know that parable? Yes, I do. Some of you clearly don't. Need to read more gospel, guys. That is talking about the saints. 
The saints, the righteous men of the church, are the ones that build godly civilizations. The righteous men of the church, like William Wilberforce, was the one that ended the slave trade. The righteous people of the church, like Florence Nightingale, were the ones that advanced the cause of medicine. It are the saints and their activity leaven the whole. They make the whole society better. That's what Jesus is talking about when he says that the kingdom of God is like yeast in bread. It causes the whole to rise. And that should give you all as Christians an ambition. An ambition to build a better civilization, a better society, a better economics, a better culture. Because you should be the leaven that raises the whole. You should be the saint that makes your church a success. That's what Christ is talking about. When Christ performs a miracle in the New Testament, it is often to capture an image of God in the Old Testament. So when Christ walked upon water, that is capturing the image in the Old Testament that God walks upon water, that he moves across the surface of the deep. When Christ breaks bread, it is the image of the bread that comes down from heaven. That image of bread which comes down from heaven is that which nourishes our souls. Our souls do not live by bread alone, but by every word that is spoken from the mouth of God. Why? Why? Because the words of truth give life. They give you vision. They give you hope. They give you courage. They give you inspiration. And with that feeding of your soul, you then go out and do things. How many of you have been inspired by words, whether from a preacher, a video, a teaching, a poem, a song? You've been inspired because those words fed your soul. And so when Christ feeds the 5,000 by miracle, it is a symbol that he himself is the bread of life and that he and his teachings will feed our souls and feed them in abundance so that we might have life and have it in abundance. And that's, and what so, when he says, beware the yeast of the Pharisees, it is because the yeast of the Pharisees does exactly the opposite of the yeast of the kingdom of God. And we see that in rabbinic Judaism. Any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? <laughs> Only to the gospel, not to my words. Go on, bro. This is going to be the last question because I'm down to my last drop of water. You said how a lot of rabbis like the average Jews, and we know the same 50 days after with the imam to the average Muslim. How do you encourage critical thinking from the average Muslim average Jew? Okay. Thank you. The best thing that you can do to encourage Muslims to think about the Christian faith is to encourage them to think for themselves. Because the reality is, the educational system that they receive in the madrasa is here and repeat, here and repeat, here and repeat. And that's the kind of argument we encounter in the corner all the time. They've heard a line and they repeat the line. And the reality is, lots of Christians are so weak in apologetics that they can't even answer a parrot-style argument. Because we have not educated ourselves on apologetics. So if you want a Muslim to genuinely consider the Christian faith, you must constantly be repeating the message, think for yourself, think for yourself. The Imams have lied to you. The Imams have lied to you. 
You've been lied to about the church. You've been lied to about the Christian faith because the Muslims have been lied to about the Christian faith and to us. So this is the best way you can encourage that kind of thinking. Meet a script with a script.